I'm Sharon Squassoni, and I direct the Proliferation and Prevention Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm here today with Chris Gadomsky, who is head of nuclear research for the Bloomberg New Energy Finance Company Network. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Chris. Yeah, it's good to much. talk to you today. Chris, um, you're an expert in financing of different kinds of energy, including nuclear. What's your take on what's happened to Japanese nuclear energy since Fukushima, and what are the prospects for the future? The prospects for the future are still undecided. Um, in our forecast, we're looking at three different scenarios for nuclear, a high, baseline, and low. Our baseline anticipates 32 gigawatts of nuclear reactors coming on in the next uh, uh, several years. Um, what, what does that mean, and how, how many reactors? About well, there, are, there was 54 reactors in Japan before the Fukushima event. Uh, they closed six, uh, bringing it down to 48. Of those 48 reactors, we anticipate a percentage coming back. How many, how much, and how fast it comes back is a big question that everybody in the country is concerned about. So we anticipate you know, the high end of that would be 32 gigawatts, 32 large reactors. And, um, but we anticipate that our baseline case is going to be slightly lower, 18 to 20 uh, large reactors coming back online. And in what time frame? Because right now, three years after the accident, there are no reactors operating. Right. Uh, there was approval given to two reactors to start operating uh, this past week. And um, they still have to go through regional approval, local approval, and also pass some operational tests before they will come online. So we think realistically the first quarter of 2015 we'll see the first reactors coming on and it will ramp up gradually from there. And how fast, how quick is going to be a, a big question. When you look from a financial perspective, right, the nuclear is a, a risky business uh, for investors. Um, actually, new build is, is risky. Um, but in the case of Japan, because there's been so much tumult over the last few years, um, it must be hard to, to guesstimate what's going to happen. We, we've been in a meeting where people were saying, oh, maybe five reactors, maybe ten reactors. Um, what, uh, you know, as a, what does the investment community look for? Well, what, what right now we have to realize that there is a $30 billion, $40 billion price tag for importing LNG, liquefied natural gas, to generate electricity that was previously generated by the, um, uh, the nuclear power plants. That's a huge drain on, the, uh, on society to spend this extra cash while you have uh, uh, assets that are idle that could be put to work. In addition to that, the price of electricity has gone up significantly by a third, I understand, in this country. And that's putting a lot of pressure on um, the community, uh, communities, and also businesses. And there's a lot of uncertainty with regards to the future price and the future ba availability of, uh, of um, electricity. That's making some com pretty, uh, companies consider offshoring their manufacturing operations. And if they go ahead and do that, that will be, have disastrous consequences for Japan because industry is leaving for less expensive electricity and 100% availability of electricity. So it's a very, very sensitive thing. The difference between the, price, uh, the investment prospects in the United States, Great Britain, for example, and Japan, is that here they're not going to be building any more new reactors. The new reactors that they have recently built that have, are almost completed uh, have come in at a very, very competitive price. You're looking at the reactors in the U.S. The risk perception, the weighted average cost of capital is how a measure of, of how risky mm -hmm. these things are perceived, is only like 5.7% for the reactors that are being built in South Carolina. If you look at the weighted average cost of capital for the new reactors that are being considered by the U.K., it's 10 to 12%, so nearly double that. And that's a very significant obstacle because these are long-term projects, require billions of dollars of financing, and the financing cost becomes a very, very big problem for uh, the economics of nuclear power in a case like that. So one of the questions we've been considering with our Japanese colleagues um, in the past few months is their <clears throat> decisions about nuclear power cover a, a wide range of capabilities. It's the reactors, but it's also their fuel cycle, their uranium enrichment. 
and there are spent fuel reprocessing, and then there's eventually what you do with the waste. In a scenario where probably not all of these reactors are going to come back online, but maybe a portion, um, could you talk a little bit about the economics of reprocessing in that scenario? I think, then let me just paint a little bit of the context. In the past, uh, Japan had a very advanced program where they were going to have a lot of reactors, reprocess the fuel, take that plutonium and put it into fast reactors, breed more plutonium because they have no, virtually no energy resources here on these islands. Um, that future is, is pretty much gone for them now. Uh, it, if they do fast reactors, it's going to take a long time. So, so their recent decisions have been to um, restart or start up their reprocessing plant at Rikasho. But there's not, you know, the, <laughs> the big, the big uh, nuclear plants that there once were. So does that make reprocessing less economic or... Is it just a question of sunk costs? <laughs> Reprocessing is more expensive process than one through, once through cycle. A lot of that has to do right now with the price of uranium and the price of enrichment of uranium. Together, they comprise about 73, 75% of the total cost of nuclear fuel. They're both trending downwards. They're trending downwards because we've got you know, a huge decrease in the amount of operating reactors in the world because of the closures in Germany, the closures in uh, the U.S., and also the closures here significantly or temporary shutdowns of the reactors here. If you're going to reprocess, there should be a critical number of reactors that makes that decision more favorable or not. Mm -hmm. If you're in a situation where you're operating five reactors, probably re reprocessing doesn't uh, make any sense. Mm -hmm. If you move it up to 15, maybe it still doesn't make any sense. But if you're starting to push close to 20 reactors that are operating, then it becomes uh, probably from the, from the Japanese perspective, a wise decision to go ahead and, and reprocess, uh, uh, reprocess the, the spent fuel. Mm -hmm. Do you think they'll wait that long or are we on a, a business as usual course? Uh, there is tension in the country between the, uh, uh, the, the citizens they have social, there's social and political concerns that can we start the reactors? And there's tension from the business community who would like to go ahead and start and guarantee a stable source of electricity. So you have two competing camps. One camp is saying keep them shut. One camp says let's go ahead and start them. So the Japanese people are used to compromise. So somehow we'll get together at a number. Whatever number that is, is really hard to, de uh, to decipher. Probably somewhere 15 to 20 reactors is our best get of, of what happens. You talk to some of the electric utilities in the country, and it's the million dollar question that they would like to have answered. How many, how soon, and for how long? Mm -hmm. In terms of, so, so the Japanese have spent more than $20 billion on this reprocessing plant at Rokasho, which hasn't yet opened, but um, should open once it goes through all the safety. Um, uh, inspections and everything else. Is that um, over the long term, how expensive does that become to reprocess this fuel in a, in, a, in a cycle where you're just recycling it once and where you're gonna have decommissioning costs? I don't know if you've ever looked at decommissioning costs for reprocessing plants, but they must be Significant. As a point of comparison, we've had several reactors shut down. The San Onofre nuclear power plant in Southern California that was shut down, they're estimating $4 billion price tag to go ahead and close, uh, decommission that plant. It's over two gigawatts. It's a large uh, power plant. If you go ahead and, and decommission some of the uh, smaller nuclear reactors, they're in a price tag somewhere between 700 and a billion dollars. That's a lot of money. A huge reprocessing facility to go ahead and decommission, that is a substantial investment and, and commitment to, to going forward. So the idea is this, is what is the future of nuclear power going to be in, in Japan? Right now, the limit is only operating the reactors for 40 years. So half of them are over 20 years, a certain percentage. So there's gonna be a gradual decline. If they decide to not go ahead and build new reactors 
and you have a gradual ebb of the number of reactors that, that are presently operating, looking at the numbers on a case-by-case -case basis, you may come to a point that reprocessing becomes a very expensive proposition. But what alternatives do you have? Uh, you can use dry cast storage, which is an interim solution, but doesn't give you the final end game. Um, you want to export it back to, to uh, other countries for, for, for reprocessing or final uh, um, uh, burial. That's another opportunity. But there are a lot of political concerns and issues that are attached with that. Mm -hmm. How expensive is, well, dry cask storage, you can, you can do it on site or you can do it at a centralized location? A million what? bucks for 100 tons of, 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 of uh, um, uh, uranium spent fuel. So, but just for audience, what's 100 tons? <laughs> well, How one cask that is 16 feet high and, mm -hmm. and uh, you, you, you can't put your arms around this. It's a fairly decent sized mm -hmm. thing. I don't know the number of exact assemblies that are in each one of those things, but they're a million dollars. It's not a huge technological investment. It becomes more of a social issue. In this country, I think what's more relevant is the social concerns and the political concerns about the future of nuclear power. It's not a matter of economics because um, they are obstacles that the community presents, the, uh, the citizens presents about the uh, continued use of nuclear power. And we're trying to figure out what is the best way for path forward for them. What percentage of a diversified portfolio should nuclear be? Stepping back for a second and looking at the, the global nuclear market and, and the supplier market, Japan, before Fukushima Daiichi, um, was looking forward to exporting nuclear power reactors. I mean, they had supplied components for many years and some of their, you know, for example, the ultra heavy forgings were, you know, considered the best in the world. Uh, but they hadn't moved aggressively into nuclear power reactor market. Is that still gonna be an option for them? And, and in general, where's nuclear power going? And if you look at uh, the 70 reactors that are under construction today, uh, by far the largest, largest majority, maybe 45 of them, are located in the Asia-Pacific region, um, followed by uh, investment in Europe and the Middle East, principally in, 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 in Eastern Europe. And America right now, we have five reactors under construction and uh, several in, uh, in South America. So the big market for nuclear power is going to be in the Asia region. And the question is how much of that is available to the Japanese manufacturers. China has a commitment to build, they're building 27 reactors now, they're planning to really significantly increase the amount of reactors they have, but they also have a goal to manufacture 70% of the components within China. India is uh, having debate whether or not to uh, get Western assistance to go ahead and build reactors or to go ahead and develop their own industry and their own technologies and move forward. One will result in a much faster deployment of nuclear power, the other one a much slower, but perhaps for the Indian economy a better approach because they'll be developing the, indu the industry themselves and putting their own people to work and delivering reactors at a less expensive cost. I think what people have to realize uh, if we go to look at what's happening in the United States, despite the fact that we have super low natural gas prices, despite, despite the fact that we have this overhang from Fukushima and concern, um, we are still building five nuclear power plants, which is very, very exciting. What we really need to go ahead and monitor in the U.S. is uh, will those reactors be delivered on time and on budget? And if so, then there'll be a tremendous, uh, there'll be a, a increased interest in future new build in the, uh, um, in the uh, United States. Nuclear power is, is a, a funny technology in that many countries think that they want to go ahead and develop a portfolio of those. It's my own opinion that those countries that really master and manage the nuclear power fleets effectively will be very, very strong leaders in the future. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Pleasure talking to you.